All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Mike Lagerquist. I am here at Bind Faith in Action in Mankato. We've got one of our regular and one of our favorite presenters today. Scott Kadelka is a naturalist at both at Miniopa and Flandreau. And I feel like I'm missing somebody. Fort Ridgely. Another state, Fort, Fort Ridgely State Park. And uh, he is presenting. He always has a variety of subjects. And today I chose this one. We're going to learn the facts about bats. And Scott's going to tell us how we should not be scared of them. We should not be uh, angry with them because of all the great things that they do for our um, ecosystem. So with that, Scott, I will turn it over to you. All right. Thanks, Mike. Good afternoon, everybody. And I'm just going to jump right into it. Just need to share my screen here. Um, got a lot to cover. Um, and uh, like, I, like Mike said, if you have a question uh, don't be afraid to ask um, as we go along. Um, bats are really um, one of the least understood animals. Um, you know, the ignorant have bestowed upon them all sorts of evil traits, and most of them are untrue. And that's what we're going to really kind of cover here. In reality, they are very valuable to our increasingly fragile environment. Um, they play an important role in pest control throughout Minnesota. Um, and unfortunately, um, you probably hear more about them today because of negatively affected by the white nose syndrome, which we'll also uh, talk about. Um, and that has resulted in significant declines in populations, uh, especially among our hybrid, hybriding uh, bats. Um, this, unfortunately, this disease is harmful and uh, usually um, fatal to hibernating bats. Um, the fungus uh, has actually, um, and I don't have right up to date, but uh, is estimated to kill more than 6 million cave bats um, in 33 states in Canada. And the unfortunate thing, again, um, it shows no signs of uh, slowing down. Uh, bats like snakes are poorly understood. Um, as a result, uh, these tiny winged mammals are feared by many. Um, much of the lore has been generated because of tropical vampire bats, uh, which feed on the blood of livestock, wildlife, and occasionally uh, humans. Um, just start right off, we don't have vampire bats here. You'd have to actually go uh, South Mexico to actually see them. Um, and the one uh, health concern of bats um, um, is they do carry rabies, but as I'll talk about later, um, when we talk about the actual uh, percentage chance of getting rabies from bats is really rare. Um, what's unique is that their forearms developed into wings, and they're the only mammal that naturally is capable of a true sustained flight. Um, they live in all kinds of habitats, uh, from deserts to tundra to rainforest. Um, again, they are mammals, so they are furry, warm-blooded animals that produce milk uh, to feed their young. Um, just a few facts about bats, um, and I'm just going to pop through them, and I got just a few other things you can easily read off the screen. I don't need to read them. Um, they com com bats actually comprise 20% of our classified mammal species. Uh, so think about that. We have over 1,200 species of bats worldwide. Um, they are found everywhere except for extremely cold regions. Um, they're a nocturnal animal um, in many roost in caves and other refugees. Um, unsure why they do that. It might be a behavior to escape uh, predators. Um, many bats are insect uh, eaters and many of, them, many of the rest actually eat fruit. And again, there are a few species that we refer to as vampire bats that actually feed on blood. Um, when, they, uh, when they're chasing insects, um, this is where one of the biggest misconceptions come from is that people feel they're being attacked um, because it feels like they're flying erratic. Um, but what they're actually doing it is they're chasing insects. And if you've ever tried to chase a mosquito yourself, um, you realize um, it's not easy. And so um, they, are, they do have the capability to easily avoid people. What they're, they're basically ignoring you and they're just looking for food, uh, driven, of course, like most animals for their next meal. 
Um, a few more things. Um, they actually don't um, catch the insects in their mouth. Um, that what they're doing, again, you think about those forearms uh, transferring into a, a wing. And so they have that capability to actually catch it in their wings. Um, and they don't all eat insects as we have talked about. Um, and the biggest one is called the flying fox. Um, this is a tropical fruit eating uh, bat. And here in uh, Minnesota, we have eight species of which one is the Northern long ear bat and that is protected under the Federal Endangered Species Act. Um, bat droppings um, have probably got a lot of uh, people talking them because um, uh, we call it Gano and it actually can, it's uh, comprised of its high uh, potassium nitrate or salt peeper, peter. So they actually used it for fertilizer. So people still actually um, uh, harvest that Gano to use as fertilizer for fields. But because of that high potassium nitrate, it can also make, be used to make gunpowder. And then during the Civil War, a lot of our gunpowder was made out of uh, bat gano. Um, again, uh, one of our biggest misconceptions is bats attacking humans. Uh, they're not attacking humans. Um, it's just our, our mis in, in misunderstanding of their actions uh, really due to our limited um, understanding of bat behavior and flight capability. So what they're doing is, again, they're looking for food. We are too big. We, we, uh, we don't, you know, um, they're not looking for us for food. So it's really that insects. That's why they're flying erratic. Um, they're darting down. And if you're a fisherman um, and you're standing on a dusk on a shoreline or even in a boat, you might feel like the bat is attacking you. But in all reality, again, it's those insects, especially coming out at night. Um, and so again, they're not attacking you, they're just looking for their food. Um, and then the other one is uh, flying into people's hair. Now the photo I have on the right is actually, uh, it's not a bat in her hair, it's a, it's a decoration or costume part of it, but I thought that was kind of cool to add. Um, what it probably dates back to medieval times when houses had roofs, but they went to had ceilings. And so if you think about bats coming into a house, they're going to roost on the, the top of those ceilings. Um, and so these flightless young bats in a, in a nursery colony in a roof rafter would have fallen probably on somebody's head. And again, then you would um, think, well, they're flying into your hair, but it's actually just falling there. They don't have the capability of flight it yet. Um, and so um, again, they're not flying at your hair. They're looking for food. Um, and probably in that situation of a bat falling into uh, somebody's sleeping, that has happened where people have been bitten. Um, so they're mammals with wings. And again, um, they're the only mammal that has a capability of, of true flight. Our flying squirrels can glide, uh, but they cannot uh, flight. And so they have this sturdy layer of skin covering their arms and long finger bones. Um, the wing membranes stretch uh, from their shoulder fingertips to its ankles. Um, and it's very uh, easy for them to um, be able to uh, fly. And so what they do is when they're ready to fly, the bat drops into the air from the roost high in a cave or a hollow tree or your attic, and it opens its arms wide. And then air slips across the top and bottom of the wings. And the widest part of the wing near the body provides that lift of coming up. So they can actually uh, have the capability to instantly roll to one side, drop and soar upward. So you again, thinking about, um, you feel like they're coming at you. It's just, they have this a remarkable ability of flight. Um, and it's again, because their wings are extremely flexible. Um, by wiggling and curling its finger bones, the bat can curve a wing to change flight direction. So very amazing when you think about it. Um, so if you think about the bone structure, um, bats have evolved very thin bones, which makes sense um, because if you're gonna fly, you don't want much weight. Think about a bird, birds have hollow bones for that same uh, purpose. 
um, and the bat's knees point backward and the soles of the feet face forward. And so as it, as it flies, its clawed toes are perfectly positioned to grab, again, those flying insects to eat. Um, so uh, again, they have a really unique uh, bone structure when you look at up there. And in sleeping upside down, yes, um, they uh, do sleep upside down during the day. It's not that bats aren't active during the day, but they're gonna be more active at night because they're nocturnal. That's when insects are out, just like any other animal. When your food is out, you're going to be awake and stuff like that. Um, so what they do is they fly toward the roosting place and they do a last second flip. And then if you think about, have you ever hung from those monkey bars? And if you can imagine having to do that for hours, um, your muscles, of course, would stiffen um, and then drop from exhaustion. Um, unlike you, a bat requires no energy to grip its roost. Um, each of its toes has a built-in lock um, and the bat's hanging weight clicks the lock into place. And then to release them, it just moves its foot um, so it sleeps, takes up only a part of a bat's day. Um, and the other part of the day, if they're not actually uh, looking for food, they bathe daily um, to keep their fur and their wings clean. And then they also spend time just looking around. And then that could be the case um, because they're looking for predators. But I like the idea of just hanging from the roof of a cave or your attic <laughs> and just looking around. Uh, many bat species have one pup, uh, usually born in midsummer. Uh, big brown bats, eastern red bats, silver hair bats, and horny bats are more likely to produce twins. Um, birth, the bat pup is hairless and blind, but quite large, actually up to one third of the mother's uh, weight. Um, and then the newborn, newborn pup clings to its mother's belly. And then the older pups hang out together with when their mothers fly out to feed at night. As they hang, they, they stretch their wings and flap to build strong muscles. And then amazingly, um, they can fly in three to five weeks. And of course, that's probably so that uh, the female or the mother doesn't have to continue to feed them. Um, so we have um, the bats that I'm talking about, um, I'm throwing out some names here. These are the ones that would be found here in Minnesota. So the tricolored and the silver hair bat, they actually roost in tree branches or under loose uh, bark. Uh, the eastern red and hoary bats hang out among clumps of leaves. And then all these forest bats have thick fur for warmth, um, of course, because they're spending uh, most of their time outside. And their colors uh, on their pattern vary. And the, and the reason is, is it's a camouflage uh, from predators like cats, raccoons, owls. Um, and then the little brown, big brown, and the northern mitosis bats usually roost in tree holes, attics, barns, and caves. And so caves is what we hear most about with this white uh, nose syndrome. And they often, females often gather in colonies uh, to give birth to pups. Um, and these colonies can have a few bats or hundreds. And then um, if you see a lone bat, it's most likely a male. Um, they will squeeze beneath uh, loose shingles or wood, wood window shut shutters. Um, and then uh, bats also will live in colonies sometimes using bat houses. Um, so for our, our bats that um, spend the uh, winter here, the, um, so the hoary bat, the Eastern red, um, bat, the silver hair bat, they all migrate hundreds of miles um, each fall. And so they head south to states uh, where they can find insects to eat throughout the winter. And then it's the tricolor, the big brown, little brown, and the northern mitosis bats are the ones that gather um, in caves and mines to hibernate. Um, and so what hibernation is, it looks like sleep because what the body is doing, it's slowing its way down to save energy. Um, and so when a little brown bat flies, its hearts might beat 1,365 times per minute. But when it actually hibernates, it's only beating 25 per, uh, beats per minute. So there's a big difference between uh, that. Um, and so here in Minnesota, um, you hear Forestville, Mystery Cave, Banning, and so Sudden, Sudan, Sudan uh, Underground Mine. They are uh, actually favorite winter um, 
habitats for them. And so this is actually a photo of Sudan uh, mine. It has these deep shafts of these old mines. And, uh, and the reason for their hibernation is because those areas have a stable air temperature and humidity. Um, and so up into white nose syndrome, um, Sudan uh, mine, underground mine could have an estimated 12,000 bats hibernating there over winter. And you can just see that whole collection of bats uh, on the wall there. And so, you know, this is where we get into the white nose syndrome because hibernation is critical piece um, to what is happening. And so fungi generally does not cause severe disease. It's actually not the fungus uh, that's killing these warm uh, blooded creatures because you think nobody dies of athlete's foot, right? So that's a fungi. Um, because of high, high uh, body temperature, they're not conducive to runaway uh, fungal growth. It's hibernation um, where they're lowering their body's temperature along with other parameters, me metabolism like breathing and heart rate. And so that fungus needs nutrition um, as well as a comfortable environment. So what it's doing is taking food from other creatures and ordinary, the Im immune system of any mammal will work to fight off that fungal parasite. But if it's hibernating, that could dial down its metabolism and it might suppress its immune responses. So that might be one of the reasons um, that we're seeing such devastation. But the major reason, and I'll get to that later, um, actually has to do with the irritation of this white nose syndrome, this fungi. Um, so again, for food, um, they uh, most of, um, eat flying insects, whether it's beetles, moths, or mosquitoes. So think about um, when you're out uh, in the summer and you hate mosquitoes, good reason to have bats. Um, and when, again, they catch um, their prey in that cupped uh, tail membrane as they dart and weave through the nighttime air. And then once the insect is caught, they transfer it to their mouth um, and then they'll do this actually in mid-flight. Um, and then around the world, bats eat all kinds of things. They are, there are fruit eating bats, nectar sipping bats. So think again, some of our food might come from bats actually pollinating. Um, some bats actually hunt frogs and mice. Others prefer fish. And then again, there's three species in other countries that feed on blood. Um, like most bats, Minnesota's seventh species or eight species um, feed on insects. Um, so we hear a lot about this radar uh, with bats um, using their senses in order to survive. I always uh, stress that when we think about food, we think, okay, we're going to go get lunch. Um, we're going to make something. We're going to go to the grocery store. Animals are most likely thinking about food all the time. Um, they're always thinking about when their next meal is. Um, and so the more capability that they have to catch. Um, and so uh, the key to the bat success of flying and finding food is the ability to use both a voice and hearing to echolate. So the sounds are vibrations of air, sound travels in waves. A bat makes the sound through its larynx, a voice box in the throat. As it flies, it calls out repeatedly up to several hundred times per second. And then that sound wave strikes an object in the bat's path and it bounces back. And then that's why you have these big ears on these bats. They work as an antenna and collect those echoes. And then by listening to those echoes, the bats discover information about the object in its environment. Is the thing smooth or rough, large or small? Is it moving? If it's so, which direction? And so that echolation helps the bats navigate around obstacles, even in a dark tangled forest. And then it can find and actually capture its food. So hunting at night, um, bats aren't afraid of the light or they're not harmed by it, um, but they have practical reasons, as I said, uh, for being creatures of the night. Many food sources available at night. So bats fly into cover of darkness for one, um, for looking for insects, but the other is to prevent hunting, being hunted by other predators. Although uh, owls are skillful nighttime hunters of bats. 
So if you look for them, they'll be zipping beams through the streetlights, dipping over lake streams and swooping about fields and forest. Um, and so there are many benefits uh, to bats. Um, one for pollinating flowers. Um, they also disperse seeds. Uh, many of our tropical plants depend entirely on bat for these services. So if you don't have the bats, then you wouldn't be able to pollinate and then the plants would not be able to live. Um, and then there are sometimes numerous enough to serve as tourist attractions. Um, if you think about, I'm gonna talk a little bit about San Antonio in that case. Um, and then they're also used as food across the Asia and Pacific Rim. Um, bats are critical to ecosystems by devouring insects, dispersing speed, seeds, and again, pollinating flowers. Um, and again, um, here they're actually uh, harvesting gano, um, again, for fertilizer and things like that. But beyond that, by studying bats, we have actually advanced our understanding of birth control and our artificial insemination vaccine production, low temperature surgery, drug testing and navigation aids for the blind. So again, much more uh, benefits than we truly understand uh, about these animals. And they are pest control. Um, they reduce the need for pesticides. Um, so here in Minnesota, bats play an important role, um, especially when it comes to mosquitoes and the corn borer moth. Um, and so a healthy bat population is important, both ecological and economically. Um, so the enormous quantities of mosquitoes and other insects that bats consume each year make summers in Minnesota more livable. So many species of bats feed on insects. We actually, they did a survey um, and they figured out that an estimated $1.4 billion were saved by farmers each year. So think about that, $1.4 billion by bats providing pest control. Where are they at at night? They're over the fields, they're looking for insects and things like that. So a bat typically eats about half its weight um, over, just in a single night. And then a mother um, that ha is pregnant or is producing milk to nurse her young, she'll eat twice as many insects. So an amount equal to her own weight. Um, so it's pretty amazing at how much they um, actually eat. Um, so there are 45 species re residing here in the United States and Canada, um, and about two dozen of those hibernate. Um, they congregate in caves, mine shafts, and even buildings. Um, I suppose it's wherever you need to go to stay uh, warm. So they need specific requirements of temperature range and humidity. So like the little brown bat, it prefers a temperature of 40 to 45 degrees and a humidity around 90%. And unfortunately that is optimal for the white nose syndrome. Um, so again, here in Minnesota, um, there has always been seven recognized bats um, but we have for the first time uh, actually uh, found a, a new bat um, uh, living here. Um, and there are, there are some thought that it could actually be reproducing here. Um, so bat species found are very small here in Minnesota, uh, weighing from two tenths of an ounce to slightly over an ounce. Um, so again, if you're eating a half your weight <laughs> and you're only weighing an ounce, uh, of course that isn't much. Um, three of the bats, the red bat, the horny bat, and the silver are all solitary. Um, so they do not uh, uh, come together. Um, they're tree living species and they never enter buildings. Uh, they seek cover during the day in tree holes and hollows behind bark or other foliage. And then again, they migrate south uh, to warmer climates for the winter. And then um, out of that seven that we know about or knew about uh, coming up to these last few years, the others are cave or colonial bats, um, named because individuals of the same species gather in colonies at various times of the year. Um, so they include the Eastern Pistrel, the Northern Mitosis, the Little Brown Mitosis and the Big Brown Bat. So those are the, the, the scientific name. I refer to the common name and we'll go back to that as I talk about each uh, individual bat. Um, and then the last two species, which is the little brown bat and the big brown bat, they're the ones that often uh, enter buildings. 
Um, and so all four of these spend the winter in Minnesota, they hibernate um, again, uh, where temperatures remain above freezing. So we'll talk about the little brown bat. It's actually smaller than a human thumb. So, so you can see how uh, a bat like this can get, <coughs> excuse me, into your house. If you're that small, it's kind of like a mouse. Excuse me, and it doesn't take much um, uh, to get into a spot. Um, so they're dependent on its two grams of stored fat to keep it live during the cold season. So hibernation is essential to making energy resources last. So if you think about this white nose syndrome and it's something that gets on their nose and it's itchy, that by that they are aroused. And so even a single arousal, say like you enter a cave and you um, or even in your house and you find them in your thing, that will cost a month's worth of fat. So it really hits those hard by being aroused. So the little brown mitosis or the little brown bat um, is actually the most common bat species here in Minnesota. It occurs uh, over most of North America. Um, together with the northern long ear bat, it hibernates in Minnesota caves and mines. Um, in summer, they roost in caves, mines, hollow trees and buildings. So they'll hang upside down in groups. Um, and uh, it's also, um, often the one that eats the most mosquitoes. So their nightly men menu includes flies, small moths, and wasp. Um, and so the big brown bat um, uh, is another common uh, species that we find in Minnesota. Um, you find them usually roosting in hollow trees, caves, buildings during the day. Um, and they actually range all the way from South America um, into Canada. And they actually feed principally on beetles. Um, and it has the Minnesota's big brown bat has a wingspan of about 10 inches. Um, they sometimes will hibernate in attic or cooler areas of building during both summer and winter. Um, others up to 200 have been found hibernating in so storm cellars during the winter. So if you can imagine your poor utility guy having to go down in a storm sewer, <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. Um, and uh, in other shelters in central Minnesota, um, they usually only produce one offspring. Um, and again, they are beetle specialists. Um, so if you think about beetles that come in and try to eat your garden plants, um, and uh, eat roots of corn and soybeans, having these big brown bat is, is very beneficial. Um, during one summer, a colony of 150 big brown bats can consume 16,000 June beetles as well as other insects. So again, um, if you would think about not having these type of uh, predators eating our insects, what would our environment look like? Uh, the northern long ear bat, um, also known as the northern mitosis, is uh, widely distributed through Canada and the eastern half of the United States. Uh, it's a medium-sized bat. Of course, when we're talking size of the bat, medium-sized bat is still fairly small. It has relatively long ears with shortly, uh, long, sharply point. Uh, it's a fleshy projector in their ear. Um, it was uh, des designated as a species of special concern in Minnesota in 1984, um, only, mostly because we only knew of a few widely distributed locations in the state. So that's another thing about uh, bats. It's not like other animals where you can do a count and try to figure out how many they are. It's a little bit tougher. Um, we know now, now they can be, our, they're actually found um, in the state both uh, summer and winter. Um, there's been a large hibernating population was documented in St. Louis County and um, have found been in, found in other caves and mines surveyed in Minnesota. Um, so human disturbance um, in caves um, have caused a, a decrease in numbers along with um, uh, wind turbine turbines um, and then habitat loss. Um, so, they still remain on a list of uh, concerned uh, animals. 
Um, so their uh, history, um, they again, natural caves, sand mines and iron mines. Um, and the sexes tend to roost separately. Um, the females will form small colonies, usually around 30 or less individuals. Um, and then they'll bear and rear their offspring together. Um, males, again, typical of animals, once they do their job, they just go off and roost by themselves. Um, and then they do not have the same high temperature needs as uh, maturity colonies. So they can live in uh, lower temperature areas. Um, they again typically roost singly or in small groups. Um, usually they come um, out of hibernation um, in May. Um, and uh, they uh, will then start um, uh, looking for their male because um, they'll have their uh, offspring actually in June or July. Um, and so if they, the earliest born usually are actually able to fly uh, by early June. And then the nursery colonies disband around that time. Um, and they forage on insects, often over water and forest clearings, under tree canopies uh, and things like that. Um, here's our tricolor bat. It's one of our smallest bats. It weighs as much as a quarter. So again, if you got a quarter in your pocket, put it in your hand, you can see how, how little they actually weigh. And again, um, you think about if you rely on flight, the less you weigh, the better. Um, they're found uh, mostly over eastern United States and southeastern Canada. Um, the first one was actually discovered in Minnesota in St. Peter, uh, 1934. Um, it has never been found in large numbers. And at this point, no maternity colony has yet been found in the state. So it could be like uh, mountain lions. Um, they're just passing through. Um, again, it's uh, uh, because of that, it's a species of special concern. Um, and so a single hibernating individual was found in 1999 and two were found in 2003 in Northeastern Minnesota, um, actually several hundred miles from uh, the previous documented north, northernmost locality in the state. Um, in between 1995 and 1999, seven dead tricolor bats were found in Lincoln County um, related to wind energy development. Um, so again, you know, due to a small population, um, it's one of those uh, bats that we're uh, concerned about. Um, for its life history, um, they actually hibernate from October until April. Um, they usually enter into a sense of stupor uh, where the body temperature will drop to that of the surrounding air temperature. Um, again, if there's any human activity um, that can cause um, these bats to waken frequently during the winter. And again, um, think about if your food source is mostly insects, where are you going to find your food in the winter? Um, and so um, if they do uh, come out of the 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 hibernating area, most likely they're not gonna make it back because they're just gonna be trying to look for food and stuff like that. Um, so it's especially uh, disturbance are especially damaging to juveniles um, because they have, they're less, less likely to survive the winter because they've had less time than adults to accumulate those fat resources. Um, the tricolor bats uh, made in fall, um, the females give birth to litters usually have two young in the spring. Uh, so the mothers are carrying their, their baby in with them throughout or uh, inside them uh, until spring. Um, and when they're young, they're growing, the mothers will roost in small maternity colonies uh, like most hibernating bats. And then after about four weeks, the young are able to fly and will actually comp accompany their mothers on foraging flights. And then they will become independent um, after another week or two. Um, they forage early um, in the evening and may catch half their body weight in insects each hour. Again, you don't weigh much, but still it's pretty amazing. They mainly uh, forage over water and tend to avoid deep woods, woods or open fields. They will eat moths, flies, beetles, and ants. You got an ant problem? There you go. Um, so their uh, uh, habitat um, is caves, mines, and tunnels. Um, they usually uh, hibernate as same sites as large uh, populations of other bats, uh, such as little brown bats. So despite 
that they are uh, different uh, species of bats. They still will hibernate in the same area, which makes sense. And then they will, in the summer, uh, generally roost singly, often in trees. Um, but some males and non-reproductive females, females also roost in their in a winter hibernation together. Uh, the silver hair bat is a forest dweller. Um, usually lives uh, near water. Uh, feeds, feeds among the trees, like like the eastern red bat. It's solitary. Um, it'll migrate again south for the winter. Um, it is a slow flyer that feeds on a variety of insects. It has a wingspan of 10 to 12 inches. Um, are, are, and as a result, they're considered a medium sized bat. Um, they weigh about eight to 12 grams, um, have short rounded furless uh, ears. Um, their name comes from the singular fur, which is unlike any other bat. It's dark brownish back black, but then the hair along the body has silver tips. Um, so its coloring actually gives a sort of icy appearance that glistens in the moonlight. It's kind of like the silver hair bat went to the salon and then asked for frosted highlights. You want to think it that way. Here's a better photo and you can see that. Um, they're one of the more common uh, bats in the United States. Um, like many other bat types, uh, they're not uh, found, fond of caves. Um, and they're northern, we're the northern part of the range. Um, usually they will choose a cave entrance for uh, slumber um, and then they'll hibernate uh, in rocky crevices and wood piles, cliff faces and small trees and places like that. Um, this is our Eastern red bat. You can see how it got its name. Um, it's noted for its most mo, for its unusual feeding habitats um, habits habits. Um, all four uh, species are solitary, roost in trees, and then they'll migrate uh, south for the winter. Um, they all live in the lone. Um, they have a nine inch wingspan, and then they'll rest in trees during the, di the daylight hours. Um, and so there. Um, and then another woodland type is our hoary bat. Um, it's the, actually Minnesota's largest bat. It weighs an ounce uh, or more. Um, and again, uh, of all these species, um, they're uh, known for being solitary. Um, that weighs five times more um, than um, our, our next biggest species. Um, and they, uh, have a wingspan of about 16 inches, and they are actually widely distributed, ranging from Iceland to Bermuda. So they're actually found all over the world. Um, the hoary bat, um, again, has that wingspan of about 15 to 17 inches. And here, the summer, it, it hangs in trees during the day, and I always think like, man, how come I've never seen one hanging from a tree? <laughs> so someday, hopefully. But again, you probably wouldn't notice it, right? It's hanging from a tree, leaves are out, it's small. Um, they start flying south um, before the leaves and insects disappear, which would make sense. Um, it does, um, by you know, really being exposed in trees, it does become a prey for crows, hawks, and other enemies. Um, the, to actually maintain their population and not become extinct, they will generally have two babies each year. And that's pretty common. Think about coyotes. Um, the more you try to kill coyotes, the more babies that they'll actually have to, to fill back that ecosystem. Um, they prefer large species of food, um, including arm, army worm moss and the forest tank caterpillar moss, which um, if you know anything about trees, that's what you don't want because they'll eat your leaves. So again, think about the hoary bat being very beneficial. Um, they will eat adult moss before they lay the eggs and become caterpillars. And uh, again, they'll eat a lot of insects, insect pests. Um, so good bat to have. Um, and so this is the bat um, that uh, was just recently uh, discovered. Um, it was actually an individual, one individual was discovered in 2016. And this actually represents the first documentation of this bat in Minnesota. Um, so it was found in um, Arden Hills. 
Um, and it was actually the first new mammal species found here in Minnesota in 25 years. Um, the bat came swooping out of the darkness into the researcher's net just before 1 a.m. Um, and it was a small brown female with a secret. And then as they untangled the tiny limbs from the fine webbing, they didn't notice anything unusual. It wasn't until they got back to the processing station did the puzzle emerge. Um, the bat size was all wrong, too small for a big brown bat, too heavy for a little brown bat. Um, and so the typical evening bat is typically found farther south and east um, with this northern limit, historically uh, central Iowa. Um, and what it came with another surprise in that it was nursing. Um, so scientists suspect she may have a, had a pair of pups tucked away uh, near Arden Hills, um, but didn't know if she arrived pregnant or just had has a, a mate nearby. And so now they're exploring them whether um, this bat would be um, uh, reproducing here in the state. Because you think about some animal species like mountain lions, we, we see mountain lions, they'll travel through um, but as far as we know today, um, none of them are reproducing. They're usually just solitary young males uh, on the search for a female. So when we're talking about bats, um, we usually start talking about Mystery Cave State Park um, down in southeastern Minnesota. Um, at one time, they had about 2,300 bats. Um, and so uh, it was a popular place uh, for that, but also for people touring. Um, alone in 2015, uh, more than 24,000 people uh, took tours of Mystery Cave, which actually wasn't discovered until 1937. Um, and unfortunately, nearly all these bats uh, have been wiped out from the white nose syndrome. Um, in 2019, uh, DNR is a 94% decline. Um, and so if you have been to Mystery Cave in recent years, they had been doing things like making you walk on special mats um, because they think that fungus is traveling by attaching itself to humans by clothing or shoes or things like that. Um, the other big uh, place for bats, um, especially when it's coming to state parks is the Sudan Underground Mine State Park. Um, their population was estimated between 10 to 15,000. So really the largest knowing winter concentration uh, bats in Minnesota. Um, they, they, they have 52 miles of horizontal tunnels and vertical shafts. So you can see why, excuse me, that, that they would track that many bats. And what's really interesting, less than half of the mine has been surveyed for bats because many of these tunnels are inaccessible uh, to, to people. So that might be a good thing um, because then um, people will not be in those areas. Um, there's been a lot of talk about whether you still do surveys because there's the potential of bringing that syndrome in. Um, and so bats, you know, really come here by the thousands um, and, and besides our hibernating bats and then they'll, they'll in the late summer um, to utilize this place. Um, and so again, um, populations, um, we don't really know how hard it's been hit. We just know it's been hit hard. So the whole deal white nose syndrome um, again, it is harmful and most likely fatal to hibernating bats, um, and it has decimated uh, populations across the eastern portions of the United States and Canada. It's on the move, heading west and north. Um, so what they've noticed when bats have had this is this unusual behavior. They'll be flying during the day in the winter or roosting outside when temperatures are below freezing. Um, and again, it's been found at both the underground, Sudan underground mine and Forestville Mystery Cave. Um, we have been trying again to take steps, um, but it's once one bat has it, you can see when they're nesting close together, it doesn't take much for that fungal spores to move from one bat to another. And again, 
what we're thinking is it's coming in on humans on their clothing or with caving gear. Um, as of now, it's, it's not known to post a threat to humans, pets or livestock or other wildlife. Um, so it's these intimate behaviors such as dense roosting that allows the fungus to spread and spread quickly. Um, and so consequences for the bats is it's that arousal and what they think is it itches. And so the bat comes out of the hibernation because it's itching, it's irritating. Um, and then the, the, the lesions on the wing also impair flight. So by being aroused in the winter, then they will start using those fat res reserves, um, which is exposing them to starvation or freezing because they're gonna emerge out of that cave and desperation for a futile search for food that's not there. There's not gonna be insects. Um, and so it's really that, that energy that's, that's waking them up and also for cleaning. If you remember, I said that bats bathe themselves daily to clean their fur and their wings. So if you have an irritant, you're going to try to clean it. They're a very clean animal. So this has really um, uh, been devastating, uh, especially among our little brown bats. And then how did it get here? Um, bats didn't fly across the Atlantic. So it was most likely carried by a human, a tourist with dirty shoes, a caver with uh, fungus fleck coveralls uh, seen in, the, in that light. Um, it's really just the latest in a long list of devastating invasive species. Um, you think about uh, the American elm um, and that used to be the popular tree everywhere. It was a beautiful uh, city tree, most boulevards, that's all they had. And uh, you know that disease had come through and pretty much wiped out our American elm population. And then what did we do? We planted, um, uh, uh, and I just totally went off my head, <laughs> um, ash trees because they were fast, they, they grew um, straight up, they gave us a canopy, and now of course we have the ash borer disease. So um, these invasive species can cause just total havoc on populations. Um, so it's history, it uh, first appeared in bats in 2006. Um, it hit hibernating bats really um, in New York, Vermont, and then again, as I said, it's just spreading fast uh, to the west and to uh, the north. Um, and so it was actually uh, first recognized in February 2006 in Howe's Cave west of Albany, uh, New York. And then a year later, people uh, reported particular where they found little brown bats flying outside nearby caves during the daylight in the midst of winter. And then again, it didn't take long. Um, for that to spread. That same fungus is seen on bats in Europe, but it doesn't, hasn't caused any noticeable distribution or deaths. So the fungus is present, but not the syndrome, not what it takes to actually start killing them. Um, so um, the spread of this across uh, has affected uh, the near northern long ear bat. Um, again, which thrives in cave populations. Um, it's depleting its store fat, um, losing to starvation and then death. Um, the fungus was first documented in Minnesota during the winter of 2011, 2012. Um, and the presence of the disease was confirmed in 2015, 2016. Declines in a number of our hibernating northern lear bat are as great as 100%. Uh, reserved in these uh, hibernating areas in 2017, the second year of the infestation. So again, it doesn't take much. Um, so what you can do is we're asking people to help monitor bats uh, statewide and report anything unusual, like sick or dead bats acting strangely at Minnesota state parks or elsewhere. Um, it's real easy, it can be reported online. Um, they have this observation report on the DNR website, and then that's reviewed by DNR staff. Um, so again, 
Um, report dead bats if they're flying around during the day. Do not handle them. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in detail. Um, but again, it's pretty easy if you want to just type in uh, DNR bats, and and this website is going to come up in your search engine. Um, so one of our things with bats is, of course, they roost in buildings, and I had bats in my house. Um, and let me tell you, having something scratch in your walls <laughs> is not a pleasant thing. Um, it has the tendency to drive some people completely crazy. Um, the thing about it is um, you're going to need an exterminator, and that's what we did. You can't kill bats. Um, and so what they do is they find the hole that the bat is coming in. Ours was an uh, older house that we lived in at the time that had a mailbox uh, built into the house. And that's where they were actually coming in. Um, and so what they do is they put a big plastic black bag and then the bats fly in there and then they take out the bats and release them somewhere else. Um, so you don't want to fool around with it. Um, how we figured it out is we came home one night and I found a bat in a windowsill and I managed to get it out and we thought that was it um, until we started hearing scratching in the walls and it wasn't mice. Um, so yes, they, they do, um, they will take residence up in an attic or a chimney or other structure and just remember how small they are so it doesn't take much. Um, what they are is they're seeking out hot, uh, dark, undisturbed areas to give birth and then they raise their single youngster, their pup. Um, and then some are, are looking for a nursery colony. There was a YMCA, if I remember right, out east they figure there were 5,000 or 10,000 bats roosting in the attic. Um, I had a friend or I have a friend down in Iowa. They got bats because the neighbor had bats. <laughs> and so they just migrated from that one house over to theirs. And I think they ended up removing 30 bats uh, from their house. Um, so again, it's, it's not the, the fun thing. Um, and so they're going to be there in the summer, again, because that's when they're having their babies and they're going out and getting the food and then coming back. Um, by mid-September, they usually leave um, because they've had their babies uh, roost and they're moving on. So removing bats from home. Um, just remember, um, a bat is going to hide or fly away. Um, so from their point of view, um, you know, if they're in a room and they're being chased by a huge person filling a broom or tennis racket, um, they are just going to try to avoid you at all costs. And of course, they fly much better than we can fling our broom or tennis racket. Um, so the recommendation is um, if you find them in a certain area, close off all the doors. Um, and then um, if it's not winter, you want to open up any windows or doors to the outside. And then give them a chance, don't chase them around, give them a chance to follow the air currents. Um, so if you wait quietly and watch, um, uh, they will most likely take off. Um, and then if you do have to pick them up, do not use your hands, always wear gloves, and then gently catch the bat and then release it outside. Um, sometimes people will, um, okay, I'm gonna have a cat run in front of me who just, messed up my <laughs> thing. <laughs> Sorry about that. So I'm going to go back. <laughs> you know, I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> yeah, for everybody that just saw that, that's Captain Otis. Um, he's a lover. He likes to be given a lot of attention. So hopefully if he comes back, he's just going to jump up in my lap. <laughs> Um, so if he's on a on on the bats on a on a table or something like that, put a, a container over them and then get a piece of paper or a, a piece of cardboard and then slide it over and then carry them out that way. See, animals everywhere. <laughs> so and then releasing a bat, um, you know, the one thing is, and and you, you, we were lucky, we found them in the summer. Um, but if you find them in the winter, just remember if you throw them out in the winter and there's no insects, they are going to die. Um, and so there is a place up in the Twin Cities that do take uh, bats and they actually have a hibernating uh, cave, special cave that they uh, uh, utilize 
Um, so what I would always stress is uh, call us um, and it's our non-game wildlife program office and they will should be able to help you um, with that situation. So bats and rabies. Yes, bats do have rabies, but it's small, very small. Less than 1% of bats have rabies. So if you look at our chart here, um, you can see the other animals. Um, and so nationwide, the incident of rabies in bats is extremely low, less than one-tenth of a percent in the wild population. So let's just talk about Minnesota. We have about 150 cases annually of rabies that are diagnosed annually in skunks. So, um, and then about a dozen cases in dogs and cats. And then this is what I found really crazy, but 30 cases per year in cows. So, so who knew? Um, and so since 1978, an average of about six rabies bats are recorded in any one year in Minnesota. So statistically, you are more likely to die of food poisoning at a church picnic than to be bitten by a rabid bat. Um, so most bats never get rabies. It's very rare. Um, rabies is that virus that occurs in the animal's saliva and may be transmitted when infected by animal bites. That's the, the scary thing about bats is when they bite something, most likely you are not going to be able to tell if you've been bitten. And so that's where it comes in if you've ever been bit in sleep. Um, so uh, it affects the nervous system, causing increased paralysis that hampers the bat's ability to fly. So if they get it, they are going to be affected too. Um, and so once the bat exhibits these symptoms, it always dies within a few days. So it's protecting yourself. Always use gloves and you want thick gloves, something that they wouldn't be able to uh, bite through. So leather gloves. Any bat bite or scratch should be considered serious. If someone has been bitten or scratched, attempt to capture that bat without damaging the head because then you wanna be analyzed for rabies. Because if they don't have rabies, you would not have to go through the shots. And then you're gonna to have to contact your health, county health officials and your doctor immediately determined to have that bat tested and what medical treatment um, you're going to need. So a few things to know about bats and rabies. Um, so again, if any you have touch or contact, if you wake up in a room and there's a bat in there, do not let that go. Cause again, it could have bitten you. Um, and in the past, um, the rabies, when they did the rabies shot, it was in your abdomen. Now it's in the arm, so it's not as painful. So you have to remember is almost always fatal if you have rabies and you get it, it once the symptoms begin. So you wanna make sure um, that it's taken care of. Uh, so whether it's your neighborhood dog or stray cat or wild animal that bites you, um, it requires that same response. Um, wash the wound, confine the animal, call your local health officer or doctor, and then submit that animal for testing. Uh, should the animal test for positive for rabies, the person will need to receive a series of six, six anti-rabies vaccinations. So again, um, fortunately, they're no longer given in the stomach. Um, so they're not as painful. In the country, 25,000 people a year receive these vaccinations, primarily for dog or cat bites. And you can see that. Um, you see Fluffy coming down the road and you go up and pet it and it bites you or the same with a cat. Um, so again, when properly administered, these treatment is 100% effective. Um, there was, if you ever listened to This American Life, they actually did a whole uh, uh, story on uh, rabies and what that does to you. And it's really kind of frightening um, if you do get rabies, because again, once it, it, the symptoms show up, it's too late. Um, bats and bridges. Uh, so they use a, uh, habitats for day and nighttime roosting, including uh, bridges and buildings. Um, and so MnDOT, uh, during routine annual bridge inspections, um, they actually discovered several federal protected northern long ear bats in the Twin Cities Metro Bridge. And so now they're actually documenting um, whether these bats are used in specific bridges. Because again, if we're having problems with our bats with this disease, um, the more places they can roost, the better they are. So 
They are um, incorporating conservation measures to minimize the impacts in bats. And um, you know, maybe they'll find a reason or some way to attract bats to these bridges um, that um, will benefit the populations. So again, if you see on a bridge, again, they will not attack you. But again, if you're bitten, um, just what we talk about, but take photo, give a detailed description and location, um, send it to our um, documentation. So again, if you, um, for MnDOT, if you just type in MnDOT wildlife ecologist, most likely you're gonna get that information. So when I was talking about tourist attractions, if you've been down to San Antonio, the I-35 bridge is downtown. It crosses the San Antonio River near Camden Street. And there's a colony of approximately 50,000 male Mexican free tail bats roosting there during the summer months. In the old days, they used to drive these bats away because they thought it was such a problem. Later, they realized the bats were there to eat insects and people did not want to go down there at the evening because there were so many mosquitoes, it just made it so bad. So once they figured that out, they let the bats be, there are hardly any mosquitoes. And now it's become a big thing, tourist attraction to go down there at the evening and see the merging of these bats coming from underneath the bridge looking for insects. So if you can imagine 50,000 bats uh, coming out um, so a very positive story, I think, um, when we're talking about bats. Wind turbines, there have been an issue um, that we know of, um, but they're trying to figure ways to mitigate this. One of the ways is um, allowing the turbine only to turn when the winds are really high, because when the turbine is at maximum speed, they do not go near it, but it's when it's that slower speed, then they're trying to look for those insects. And then that's what they're getting caught up there. So they are, they've found bats dead under there, not large numbers, but still enough to be concerned. So our vampire bats. So there's actually three species that feed only on blood. These are our true vampire bats. They are the common vampire bat, the hairy legged vampire bat and the white winged vampire bat. Um, the common vampire bat usually feeds on blood of mammals, where the other two feed primary on the blood of birds. Um, and so these three true uh, vampire bats live in the New World, but it's ranging from Mexico southward to Brazil, Chile, and Argentina. So most of these bats are unable to move about on the ground, but most bats are unable to move about on the ground, but vampire bats are an exception. So this is probably the other scary thing. So they can walk and run using a bounding gate in which the four limbs are used instead of the hind limbs to propel themselves forward. So if you can imagine <laughs> being scared of bats and then seeing one run at you. Um, and then the, the common vampire bat actually has a really good eyesight and a well-developed sense of smell and hearing. So uh, not only do they look, but the fact that they come running at you, it's gotta be a little freaky. Um, they do eat blood. Um, so, um, but this is kind of interesting. I believe the only bats who adopt a young, the young bat, something happens if something happens to the bat's mother. So that's kind of cool. Um, they gather in colonies, usually a hundred animals, but sometimes a thousand or more. So if you're really freaked out. Um, in one year, they can drink the blood of 25 or 100 vampire breaks the drink of blood of 25 cows. Um, and they have the fewest teeth of all bat species, uh, surprisingly. Um, and they do not have enamel, which makes their teeth extremely sharp. And then the common fur from horses rather than cattle, uh, given a choice. Um, so again, um, uh, we don't have them here, so nothing to worry about there. Um, and usually consume about one ounce of blood. So I think the thing is, is they're not gonna suck your blood dry. So uh, let's help bats. Um, you can do things like join bat conservation natural. Uh, build a few bat boxes to provide roof sites. Keep them out of your house. If you got some large trees, um, they're a great place to have them. Um, and then protect those nursery colonies. So um, don't go into caves thinking that this is a great way to explore because you might be frightening bats. And definitely never in the winter. 
um, because that can really cause a lot of problems. And then educate your family and friends that bats aren't need to be fear that they provide a lot of benefits and then document them so that uh, we know what's happening and like that and then make a donation to the non-game wildlife foundation fund fund here in minnesota you can do that on your taxes that helps us um, protect the bats but also research these bats so you know building a bat house they're actually not that hard you can just go online um, you can find um, uh, directions. Um, there's also the book called Woodworking for Wildlife by Carol Henderson that has simple plans um, in there. Um, so, you know, in collusion, you know, despite their usefulness to humans, uh, many of our 900 species of bats found worldwide today are disappearing because human activities that destroy the bats and especially their habitat. Um, there are six species listed here in the United States that are endangered. Um, we have two special concern bats found here in Minnesota. But just remember, bats eat insects and lots of them. Um, studies show uh, bats may eat thousands of mosquitoes in one night, thousands of, of mosquitoes. So our myths and misinformation about to have bats have created a needless fear of the creature. And um, so there is actually a Minnesota Bat Festival and it's held at the Minnesota Wildlife National Wildlife Refuge. Um, so hopefully maybe this summer they will be holding that again. And I just wanna say thank you. And if you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask and I will try to answer them. I was wondering, Scott, since we are nowhere near San Antonio, are there any local places that we could go to to see a lot of bats? I would imagine if you get anywhere where there's a bridge over a river and you get down there at evening, that there probably might be a chance that you're going. I, I don't know of any place specific, um, but I would imagine probably some of these quiet rural bridges would mm -hmm. probably be a good place just because there's not a lot of traffic, not a lot of disruption. But think about 50,000 bats in downtown San Antonio. So I guess go wherever the mosquitoes are. Um, you're probably going to see them. There you go. Anybody else have any questions for Scott? How do we feel about bats? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the rabies thing is always scary, but I think that you have to recognize it's much scarier for wild cats and dogs, or even cats and dogs that, um, you know, this is, I think, why, you know, you keep and pets on leashes, um, because there's, there's a reason for that. And usually, when animals do have rabies, you know, something's up, because they're outside, they're, they're stumbling along, you know, there's, their saliva is, you know, dripping down their mouth. So, Usually they, it's pretty easy. I've run into a lot of rabies animals in my lifetime and it's pretty easy to recognize that they have it. Okay. Any other questions? Seeing none, I will just remind folks that uh, we do post these presentations, the video of them on our vinevolunteers.com page. Just click on the virtual vine that you'll find under the, the main photo. There's all kinds of interesting stuff there. There's, uh, there's videos of exercise classes. There's a listing of our upcoming educational presentations. And then toward the bottom of the page is where we have the links to our YouTube channel where you'll find a lot of our past presentations. So feel free to share that with, with friends who may have wanted to see the bat presentation and just missed out. <laughs> well, thanks everybody. Thanks, Mike. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Everybody have Bye a great now. rest of your, everybody have a great